Before I introduce Philippa Gregory, I'd like to stress that there is a book signing immediately after this talk for both Philippa and Diana Gabaldon. And please, everyone, as I said earlier, buy the book, uh, meet the real person. Uh, it's what this weekend's about. Uh, Philippa Gregory, I confess, is one of the authors that I'm in awe of. It, it isn't just that she's achieved everything any author could ever hope to achieve uh, with a string of international bestsellers, TV adaptations, and a Hollywood film. Um, for me, it's much more personal uh, because she's taken the genre that I love and wrestled a space for it in the bookshops. She's achieved this not just by talent, but by daring. Uh, daring to write about little-known women, daring to give these women rich personal and sexual lives, daring to say, no, uh, the interesting story is not always the one the history books have framed for us. Uh, her latest book, just released, is The Kingmaker's Daughter, about Anne Neville. Also released this year was Changeling, first in a series of young adult books set in the pivotal year of 1453. And filming right now for the BBC is a ten-part adaptation of The Cousins' War. And if you go to our website, you can see a lovely picture of Philippa standing with some of the cast all holding her books. So, ladies and gentlemen, Philippa Gregory. Thank you. Hello, colleagues. It's really, really lovely to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor as well, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about today, uh, and I have to say, I hardly ever talk with notes, and because it was you, I prepared. <laughs> and it's, it's tons. It's terrifying. We're going to have to crack on, but um, really, why I wanted to talk at a far more serious and detailed level than I usually do when I'm just doing an author talk for readers is because what I'm celebrating, I think, with you today is the very form of the historical novel. I want to start with a quotation from a book of essays, Dust, by Carolyn Steedman. She's writing here about it, how it feels to go into the archive for historical research. You know you will not finish that there will be something left unread, unnoted, untranscribed. You know perfectly well that the infinite heaps of things they recorded, the notes and traces that these people left behind, constitute practically nothing at all. There is a great, brown, slow-moving, endless river of everything. And then it's tiny flotsam that has ended in the record office you're at work in. Your craft is to conjure a social system from a nutmeg grater, and your competence in that was established long ago. Your anxiety is more precise and more prosaic. It's about PTS2 stroke one stroke one, which only arrived from the stacks that afternoon, which is enormous, and which you will never get through. <laughs> and now we have a new sort of archive, and it's even bigger. Cars with cameras provided by the internet giant search engine Google have driven all around the world photographing every single street, giving us a total picture of a world in that moment on that day. It's an extraordinary venture, a God's view of the world. It's the capture of the moment, and surely the capture of the moment is what we call history. But the trouble with the archive, whether it's Google Street View or the only box of documents saved from the fire in the attic, is that they are always quite random. The documents we have always tell us about people being atypical, the boy with the horse's head tells us nothing about horses or boys. He raises more questions than he answers. People caught in the moment pose questions. Why are they doing this? When it's horribly obvious what they're doing, what possessed them to do it? People in the archives are not there because they're leading ordinary, typical lives. They're not the vast majority doing typical things. They're there because they have to be recorded. They are criminal or heroic. They're deviant or exceptional. Someone else has decided they shall be there. And this is what gives us the mountain, the quagmire of facts, Steedman's river of everything. But the facts are not history. A mere record of events is not history, any more than snap, snap, snap is not photography. A box of papers is not history. A hundred boxes of papers are not history. The archive is not history. The archive is just a collection of documents, a jumble of words. Google Street View is an album of meaningless visuals. To have history, you have to have narrative. This, for instance, is a Google Street View picture. And this is the narrative. 
John Ruffman, a young photo artist, split up with his girlfriend. And he realized when he was filled with regret that he had no photograph of her. Then he remembered they'd taken a holiday in Italy and he'd seen a Google streetcar go by. He searched and he searched. He went like a historian deep into the Google Street Archive, looking for the location and the date and the time. And then he found her again, the girl he had loved but would never see again. Raffman worked like a historian looking through the Google Archive and he found this primary source material. And using it as his source material, he constructed that narrative, his own history of the photograph the particular resonance the story has for us, a young love, a loss, regret, and then more than anything else, especially for us, the attempt to capture something from the past. This is what makes us history readers. And of course, it's incredibly selective. And it's selective, there's bias. The document shows her, but it's not her story. We don't know what she thought about the ending of the relationship. We certainly don't know, though I for one would love to know, what she felt about her ex-boyfriend finding a photograph, which she didn't even know was being taken, turning it into an account, into an artwork, which in time becomes part of a book, which is reviewed, and I read the review and go, aha, I'm going to talk to HNS about the archive, that's interesting. And now I've shown the photograph to all of you. And history is a public art. And she is now a historical fact. She's a historical fact as defined by E.H. Carr, who says that a historical fact has to appear in three publications. There she was, possibly naked, on the beach. Now she's a fact of history. I would define history as a narrative about the past that selects from all the known facts that links them or explains them or tells a story about them. And it is that narrative that rescues the past from the incomprehensible tyranny of the millions of random facts. Facts are the starting point, but they're not the narrative. God may know everything, but that doesn't help him much. He's not a historian. The recording angel records everything, but the record of everything is just like the archive. It's too much. Too many facts and not enough significance. Too much material, not enough weighing. To make a judgment, the recording angel has to evaluate, wait, consider. He probably has to write a story. The first act of the historian is to select the events he or she is interested in from all the millions and millions of things that have happened. The earliest histories we have are so short that we can see they've been rigorously selected with criteria that we don't even now share. You can't read an early chronicle without intense awareness that the chronicler has a very, very strong sense of what he's going to put in his chronicle. Nothing about his personal life, often nothing about his community in action, sometimes nothing he has directly observed at all. Horribly, very often nothing that we are interested in. This is from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. I defy you to be interested in it. <laughs> And I direct you in particular to AD 6. From the beginning of the world to this year, we're a gone 5,200 winters. Thank you. <laughs> this reminds me gloriously, actually, of Sauron by Edward Rutherford. Approximately 3,500 years passed, and in the remote northern island of Britain, as far as we can tell, <laughs> very little happened. <laughs> And that reminds me in turn of my Uncle Rob's Christmas Roundup, which came to me in 2010 and read, November 2010, bad news, the washing machine broke. Good news, got the all clear on my brain tumour. <laughs> it's about selection of events, and then it's about making a narrative. The macro historians, those who are interested in the great sweep of events, those who write about the rise of capitalism or the decline of magic, they select big facts, annual outputs, national literacy, nationwide witch hunts, and they write epic history which soars across time and space. Religion and the decline of magic, the history of the English-speaking peoples, the road to divorce, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. For historians like these, really very often not a lot happens, for there is very much that they're not interested in. They're interested principally in the facts which demonstrate their epic view their selection filter is very high. Facts which disagree with the epic view have to either be fitted in, volunteered as the exception, or, for the less scrupulous historian, knocked out altogether. Some facts never even emerge for them. They're not looking for them, and they don't see them. We're all deeply indebted to Daniel J. Simon for this video. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball.
The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? <laughs> For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? It's this tendency to miss out the unexpected facts, a filter set long before the research begins, which is how we receive and maintain an accepted view of history, a view that will be overturned when later historians arrive with a different filter. This is how, for example, you establish a history that leaves out half the population because you're not looking for the existence or the lives of women. Since the major universities in the UK and the US were completely closed to women before 1920, every scholarly history before then, that date, will have been written by a man who had been taught by a man, whose thesis was examined by a man, whose book would have been published by a male publisher and reviewed by a male critic. The tradition of scholarship was powerfully and exclusively male. Naturally enough, all these male historians, though very good historians, didn't, were not disposed to look for a history of women. They were writing political and military literature. Women weren't politicians or generals. Women weren't there in the records that the historians were studying. And the historians, their eyes on great political and military events, didn't miss them. This is how you get an accepted view of history. This is how you lose facts which don't make the historical record they took place, but they get omitted. They don't fit with the historian's epic view. They don't make the cut. And these, as it happens, are the facts that I like to work with. For example, Mary Boleyn. Mary Boleyn, sister of the far more famous Anne, was Henry VIII's lover and perhaps the mother of his child. Perhaps they had two children together. There was her picture in Hever Castle, but nobody had identified it as hers, and even now, it's not a certain identification. She was in the archives. She even made it to the footnotes, but she didn't make it into the pages of the histories of the time. In 1999, I found her just as a name, in the archive of the Navy on the sea between Wales and Ireland. The Mary Boleyn, 100 tons, William Simmons' captain, 79 men, 352 pounds, eight shillings, six and a halfpence. And just to prove the point of the gorilla, I confess that when I was preparing the slides for this talk, having looked at this document a dozen times, for the first time I noticed the name of the ship before Mary Boleyn. It's the Matthew of Bristol, the ship that John Cabot sailed to America in 1497. That was a hell of a navy that year, it really was. <laughs> I looked up the name Mary Boleyn and I found that she was Anne Boleyn's sister. I had not heard of her before then. I followed the name through the documents to find the outline of her story and the gaps of time when she's not mentioned in any of the contemporary records at all. It's only certain to find her in the history books when Henry wants to marry Anne Boleyn and has to appeal, apply for papal dispensation since he was previously having sex with her sister. The question of affinity through sleeping with siblings is, of course, the very heart of Henry VIII's great matter with his divorce from Catherine. And since it's part of Henry's history, since it's legal history, since it's highly recorded, that's where we find her as a footnote to the more important event. And then I had my own greatest moment in the archive when I found a letter written by Mary herself. And amazingly, it is a letter defending her marriage for love to William Stafford. This is a time when women were married by their families for their advancement. This is 200 years before historians believe love was a common motive for marriage. It's an extraordinary document to anyone interested in any Tudor woman's inner thoughts, to anyone interested in an elite woman choosing to marry for love, to anyone interested in the person in the footnote. This is Mary Boleyn's letter. But one good thing, good master secretary, consider that he was young and love overcame reason, and for my part I saw so much honesty in him that I loved him as well as he did me, and was in bondage, and glad I was to be at liberty, so that for my part I saw that all the world did set so little by me, and he so much, that I thought I could take no better way but to take him and to forsake all other ways and live a good, honest life with him. For well I might have had a better man of birth and hire, but I assure you, I could never have had one that should have loved me so well, nor a more honest man. This is archive gold. Those of you who work in this period, you know what this is. 
It's a letter written at a time of extreme difficulty by a Tudor woman. I don't know another letter like that. Describing her own circumstances and inner thoughts, it's an absolute rarity in the early modern time. And once I saw this, I knew it was a history waiting to be written. And it amazed me that as far as I knew, I was the first historian to think that of Mary Boleyn. Why on earth was no one very interested in Mary Boleyn? Well, she was a woman without power or influence. This letter is a begging letter to Thomas Cromwell. She made no difference to the big developments of the time. Unlike her sister, she didn't contribute to the Reformation or attempt to poison the Archbishop of Canterbury. She had two children during her royal affair, but they took her husband's name and they never claimed to be royal bastards. And she was one of several mistresses to a king who memorably had many, many wives. I adore this picture. I, I, <laughs> and I really can't help but remark how wonderfully this picture demonstrates the role of women in popular history. <laughs> And if you are disposed to accuracy, pedantic accuracy in this matter, we're too short of a full set. <laughs> so does this vivid portrayal of women in history tell us why there is no biography of Mary Boleyn? I think it does. As we see here, it's a history of the reign of Henry VI. There are far too many women in it anyway. You've got six wives, three daughters, two sisters, a mother, a formidable grandmother, all with their stories and their opinions. There are simply too many women already in the Tudor period. So why did I bother with her? Well, I studied for my first degree at Sussex University in the late 1970s when the new history of working people, of minorities, of women was coming through from the experimental radical lecturers into the, young, into the university to the undergraduates. From us, it would go on to the students we would teach in universities, the books we would write, the children we would educate in schools, or the fictions we would imagine. Mary Boleyn's story struck me as an extraordinary appropriate subject for me. I'm a woman with an interest in women's history, an interest in social history, an interest in the history of common people as well as the court and Tudor aspirations, and an absolute passion for a strong narrative. The relatively few historical facts about Mary Boleyn's life would have made an excellent basis for the history of a Tudor woman, but for me, it was even better to write a novel. Whoop, I just fell down a hole. <laughs> that was not kind of in the script as a comic turn, just those of you who are dozing off at the back. No. Historical fiction is as old as the novel itself. The very first fictions were entitled histories and are delightedly far-fetched fictional biographies. The trend to write history as fiction has been much advanced in our times by the tendency of history, especially popular history, to be written with novelist skills by historians who want a large audience and who know that the way to get it is to write narrative history. They know they have to present history as good stories. Historian David Starkey calls his very good history, The Six Wives of Henry VIII, one of the world's greatest stories. It contains a whole world of literature within itself, it is more far-fetched than any soap opera, as sexy and violent as any tabloid, and darker and more disturbing than the legend of Bluebeard. It is both a great love story and a supreme political thriller. Though, alas for us. David Starkey makes clear elsewhere that he despises the historical novel form in the hands of lesser writers than himself, <laughs> and of course when it is read by even lesser readers. The modern historical novel is largely written about women, written by women, and read by women. Stuff like The Other Boleyn Girl. It is a quite amazing book in the sense that the author, Philippa Gregory, has managed to write a historical novel based on four known facts. I think that's one fact per 75 pages. <laughs> Leaving aside David Starkey's contempt, and really we always have to leave aside David Starkey's <laughs> contempt. <laughs> Recent publications seem to me to be developing into fascinating and genuine hybrids. Kate Summerscale's two recent works, The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher and Mrs. Robinson's Disgrace, are both histories with all the scholarly apparatus and caveats of historical writing, but they read as dramatically and stylistically, and the story unfolds as in a novel. 
Anne Rowe's Perkin Warbeck seems to me to go even further. It reads like a novel of discovery, tracing the career of an imagined Perkin Warbeck with really beautiful language and carefully controlled release of the historical facts. It's very like a novel. It's very like a history. Rodney Bolt, history play, is absolutely a novel, except that it is a speculation into the authorship of the Shakespeare plays, and it relates an imagined, or at any rate, unproven conspiracy theory, just as a history would do. Earlier still, John Files, a French lieutenant's woman, memorably told a fictional story with a narrator stepping away from the fiction to provide historical remarks that are absolutely integrated into the body of the novel that give it such a haunting, unique flavor. These books and many others seem to be developing new and subtle combinations of fact and fiction. I notice, too, that they're all about deception. They're all about a liar. In the real world, melding fact and fiction, truth and lies. And I have to wonder if there is something uniquely suitable about the form of historical fiction when you're describing something that may or may not be fact, that may or may not be true. The slate of hand in the real world is beautifully told in the historical novel form. I think it's a perfect match for the subject. And I think we'll see more books like this, to the further confusion of purist critics, who continue to ask, is it fact? Is it fiction? Is it based on history? Is it related to truth? And what I'd really like to suggest today is that a historical novel can be all these things, that when it is all these things, it's a triumph. To go from one glimpsed reference and one letter, as I did with Mary Boleyn, to the discovery of a life is the work of microhistory. I did it with my historian's hat on. But to go from the microhistory of a life to a work of fiction is another act altogether. And I am really accustomed to explaining that historical fiction is the animation and recreation of a life, the fleshing out of historical bones, the breath into the skeleton. And I imagine you tell people all the time on your own account but today, amongst ourselves, I want to emphasize that more important than anything else is the selection of facts which are going to make the pattern of the novel, which create the significance of the form of the art of the novel, crafting history into a form of art. That's the work of the historical novelist. As a novelist, I shape a historical narrative. There's a long chronicle of the life starting with birth and ending with death. If any of you ever dream of doing it, please, please, please never start a novel which says, the cry of the newborn child echoed down the stone galleries as a cold, sleety wind blew outside. Everybody's born. It's not interesting. It's not clever. You don't even do it on purpose. <laughs> start, start with something interesting that somebody does. Anyway, biographers have to start with birth. That's their job. They have to end with death. That's that's their job. We're crafting an art form. We can start anywhere we damn well want. Sorry, that's not that. <laughs> <laughs> it's my job to look at the life and pick out what interests me, what I think tells me the greater truth about the life, about who this person is, what their story means to me over the two periods of time that are haunting me as I write. The one period is the several years that I'm going to spend with these people, coming to know them, it's the life of my relationship with them. And at the same time, the long, yawning centuries between their true life, their vibrant life, the life they lived, and mine. I shape the story according to my response to them. I don't shape the facts. They're there in the historical record. They're there in the archive. But I use them. I select them. And I emphasize them. I use all the novelist arts I can, language, symbolism, pace, narrational voice, to create a novel based on history. I'd like to show you an example of how the view of the novelist shapes the account that is based on the history. We'll start with the record of the historical event. The young princess of Spain, Catherine of Aragon, arrived in England and stayed the night at Dogmasfield Palace, Hampshire. Henry VII rode down to see her before her official arrival in London. We know this because the ambassador of Spain, de Ayala, recorded his version of the event and sent it to her parents, who kept it in their archives. So already, there's a historical event and we have one person selected, biased, report of it. This is what he said. As soon as the princess servants were ascertained of the coming of the king, as their archbishop, the bishop, with other of her retinue and council, they showed him that the princess was in her rest when he answered in such form, that if she were in her bed, he would see, conform with her, for that was the mind and the intent of his coming, and thus, convenient leisure to her respited, she gave him an honorable meeting in her third chamber, where were pursued the most 
goodly words and uttered of language of both parties to her such great joy and gladness as in any person might have conveniently had. This is how Jean Playdy in 1961, I'm sure having read that document, describes the scene. Catherine was sitting with her maids of honour when they heard the commotion from the hall below. It had been too miserable a day for them to leave Bishop's Palace, and it had been decided that they would remain there till the rain stopped. Elvira burst on them, and never had Catherine seen her so agitated. The king is below, she said, and never had Catherine seen her in such alarm. Catherine stood up. He insists on seeing you. He declares he will see you. I cannot imagine what their highnesses will say when this reaches their ears. But does not the King of England know of my parents' wishes? It would seem that there is only one person whose wishes are concerned in this place, and that is the King of England. What is happening below? The Count of Cabra is telling the King that you are not to be seen till after the wedding, and the King is saying that he will not wait. Then there is only one thing to be done, said Catherine quietly. This is England, and when we are in England, we must obey the King. Let there be no more protests. We must forget our own customs and learn theirs. Let it be known that I am ready to receive the king. Elvira stared at her in astonishment. In that moment, Catherine looked very like her mother, and it was impossible for Elvira to disobey her, as it would have been to disobey Isabella of Castile. Hmm. I would draw your attention to a few features of this writing. The focus of the piece is the deference to Catherine, to her judgment and to her inherited authority. The duenna, a lady but not a royal, is mistaken and ill-judging compared to the grace and wisdom of her young charge, a royal princess. I think this is part of the very deferential view towards monarchy that was typical of England in the 1960s. It's also written very formally. Again, I think this is an issue of deference, as if the author is talking about very important people in the very important past. It's written in a rather stodgy way to my ears, in the past tense, in a passive voice. It had been too miserable a day for them to leave the bishop's palace, and it had been decided that they should remain there until the rain stopped. I think if you were to read the whole novel and see its views on class, on gender, and on romance, you would date it at once as a work of the 1950s, 1960s. My version of this scene draws on exactly the same historical record, because we have only two historical records of this scene. And it goes like this, 2005. I say you cannot come in. If you were the King of England himself, you could not come in. I am the King of England, Henry Tudor said without a flicker of amusement. And she can either come out right now, or I damned well will come in and my son will follow me. The Infanta has already sent word to the King that she cannot see him, the Duenna said witheringly. The nobleman of her court rode out to explain him that she is in seclusion, a lady of Spain. Do you think that the King of England would come riding down the road when the Infanta herself has refused to see him? What sort of a man do you think he is? Exactly like this one, he said, and thrust his fist with the great gold ring towards her face. The Count de Cabra came into the hall in a rush and at once recognized the lean 40-year-old man threatening the Infanta's duenna with a clenched fist. A few aghast servitors behind him and gasped, the king. At the same moment, the duenna recognized the new badge of England, the combined roses of York and Lancaster, and recoiled. The count skidded to a halt and threw himself into a low bow. The king, he hissed, his voice muffled by speaking with his head on his knees. The duenna gave a little gasp of horror and dropped into a deep curtsy. Get up, the king said, and fetch her. Briefly, what are the differences? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Briefly, what are the differences? The writing is more lively. There's more physical action in the scene at the door is enacted, not reported. There's comedy in here as well, with the mistaken identity of the king and the immediacy of the description gives us a sense of the character of both the king and the duenna as people determined to have their own way. We even get a physical description of Henry VII slid into this scene. It's realistic and comedic writing, much more typical of the 21st century with its lack of deference and its energy and action. I would call it realistic, realistic to my century, and of course, hopefully, with its culture of film and television and naturalistic language. But hopefully, it's realistic also about the 15th century. But of course, my view of human nature colors my telling of this story. 
I don't think Henry VII or Catherine of Aragon are innately superior to the people I know in my own times. I don't think they're more chivalric or poised or elegant. I don't give them particularly refined language to speak. I like to portray them as in some way ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances in a historic world. And I'm very clear that in 50 years' time, your grandson or granddaughter may stand here and explain to my heirs out there how slow and tedious were the novels of Philippa Gregory since she went on and on about women and on and on about feminism and missed, totally missed the entire central point of history, which is what? I don't know. I don't know what in 50 years will seem to be the most important thing to write about for my grandson or your granddaughters any more than Jean Plady could foresee me. I really hope Jean Plady will be shocked and appalled by my views, and I hope that I will be shocked and appalled by my grandchildren. But I know that the historical novel of 2062 will use the same sources and the same material as we do and come to completely different conclusions about what is interesting. Some very brief thoughts on the novel. When people write about historical fiction, they always emphasize the history and they worry about the conflict between writing fiction and writing history. I wish I had a pound for every time someone asks me how much of my novel is fiction and how much is history, as if I approached writing like a recipe book and had a cup of fact and a spoonful of fiction on every page, as if a novel is not by its very nature fiction and history is not by its very nature based on fact. I'd like to make a plea today that we think of ourselves as novelists, I'd like us to be proud of being novelists. After 26 years of writing historical fiction, I'm in becoming increasingly assertive about writing fiction as my chosen form. So many people ask me questions that have as the background premise that I should, for the benefit of my readers, for the exercise of my own scholarship, if I want to be taken seriously, write history, not fiction. Actually, I have written straight history. I wrote a PhD thesis on the 18th century popular novel, one of the most unsuccessful books I've ever published. <laughs> <laughs> Only three copies. <laughs> and I've written a history book jointly with two other historians. I worked for five years as a news journalist. I can write nonfiction, but most of my work is fiction. I don't write historical fiction because I can't be bothered to do the research, and I would rather make things up. I don't write historical fiction because the historical reality is too unattractive and I would rather imagine a rosier world. I don't write historical fiction because I can't think of a plot. And actually, I do have more than one fact every 75 pages. <laughs> I write historical fiction because I adore the novel form and because I was born and bred as a novelist. I love the form of the novel. I would be a novelist even if I weren't a historian. I can't stop myself composing fiction. I see the world as an unfolding narrative, and I retell it like that. For me, the novel is the finest form of art available. And like so many other people, it's the only art form I study daily. I go to the opera a couple of times a year, ballet maybe twice. I go and see paintings occasionally. I hardly ever go to a concert. But almost every day of my life since I was a child of four, I've read fiction, and it brings me intense, constant, reliable joy. When I finish a novel in which the content is matched with the style, I feel deeply moved. Not even because of the content of the story, but because the form itself is such a thing of beauty. When I read Howard's End, or Tender is the Night, or Portrait of a Lady, or Persuasion, it makes me feel as if I've heard sung Eucharist in a great cathedral. It moves me above and beyond my understanding. So I announce today, I am never again going to apologize for writing history in a novel form. I think the form is peculiarly suited to the subject. I think the form enhances the subject for the reader. I think at best it rescues history from the past. It makes the past an imaginary lived current experience. Badly done, of course. It's one of the worst forms of Tosh published. <laughs> But done well, it does what life itself longs to do. It does what the resurrection does. It conquers death and time. And you can't ask more from a work of art than that. And also, fiction does more than history can do. It can tell the story that history cannot tell. For example, 1483, the two young sons of Edward IV of England were put into the Tower of London under the command of their uncle who became Richard III. That's nothing like them. <laughs> 
But, you know, it's a nice fiction. They never came out, and we have no evidence as to their fate. But later that year, their mother, the widowed Queen Elizabeth, released all her surviving children into the custody of that same uncle. These are ascertainable historical facts. Now, here I work as a historian speculating. Surely, I say with my historian's hat on, there must have been a meeting, there must have been a moment when she said to him, where are, the, where are my sons? And his answer must have been so satisfactory that she agreed to come out of sanctuary and put her daughters into his keeping. But there is no record of that meeting. And because there's no record of it, historians rightly don't mention it. They can't mention it. And so the amazing decision of Elizabeth to give her daughters into the care of the man generally regarded as the murderer of her sons is never questioned. Some historians of the period don't even mention it. It's so incomprehensible, they just pass over it in silence. The rigor of history in reciting only the known facts makes a nonsense of the past. And interestingly and disturbingly, those historians who do wonder at Elizabeth behaving in such an irrational fashion often fall back for their explanation on the established, well-known fact of the nature of women. They have no explanation for anything but the irrational behavior, and so they say, well, irrationality is the nature of women. There's a woman's irrationality woven into the historical record. As Wikipedia solemnly explains so that we understand, Elizabeth's subsequent behavior has been a source of frustration to historians. <laughs> really, what a way to carry on. <laughs> And this is when fiction can contribute to our understanding. I couldn't write a novel about a rational, passionate, well-judging Elizabeth Woodville without writing that scene. When she asked Richard III, where are her sons? Her life makes no sense without it. This completely fictional scene, fictional since I have invented it, is truer than the history which does not know of it. When the bereaved mother says to the man who appears to be the murderer of her two sons, what did you do? What have you done? There's a truth here for which there are no supporting facts. The scene which is invented seems to be a better thing than the gap which history leaves and then explains away. And there's another way in which I think fiction may be more true than history to the life as it was lived. Historians depend on the records of the outer life. This is true of the times, but especially of early history, when people don't keep diaries and rarely record their thoughts and feelings. Whoops. That's the whole again. Everyone awake? Good. <laughs> Two more pages. Um, but if you want to know, the novel is always a story of the inner life, about spiritual growth, about maturity, about feelings. If you want to know what Queen Elizabeth I was like as a person, you'll first consult the history of what she did, but as you do so almost unconsciously, you will imaginatively construct a version of her personality. You will, in short, fictionalize her. And every historian who writes a biography does this, and some of them fail to acknowledge that they're doing so. When I write of Mary Boleyn speaking the words I have put in her mouth, I know I am describing an imagined character. When a historian writes of Mary Boleyn intimately as if they are describing someone they know, they are describing an imagined character. As a novelist, I acknowledge the fiction. As a writer of fiction, I am, in that sense, more truthful. When we dramatize facts, when we invent a scene to illustrate them, then when we create a moment that might not be fact but might be truth, when we describe the inner life of a character which cannot be known from the historical facts but can be understood from them, we might be speaking of something which is not a recorded fact but which might be deeply true, something that is imagined but insightful, something that is fiction but is true. And finally... A word about lady novelists. The novel is a form peculiarly suited to women for historic reasons of poverty, lack of education, the dominance of men in more scholarly forms, the exclusion of women from institutions, and the opportunity for women to hide under the name of anonymous from the abuses of male professional critics who feared the amateur woman genius in the 18th century and arguably still do. Since the earliest days of commercial publishing, women have written novels and been criticized for doing so. Historical fiction has a bad name, but women writers have an even worse one. If you are, like me, a woman writer of historical fiction and you want a literary reputation, then truly, I am here to tell you, you labor in vain. <laughs> As George Eliot, herself a woman writer, herself a historical novelist, memorably wrote, 
Silly novels by lady novelists are a genus with many species determined by the particular quality of silliness that predominates in them. The frothy, the prosy, the pious, or the pedantic. But it is a mixture of all these, a composite order of feminine fatuity that produces the largest class of such novels, which we will distinguish as the mind and millinery species. <laughs> we don't have time to rebut this, except to say, let's pass on her and Starkey. Um, Let's pass to this fact from the archive that I stumbled across in a cloud of archive dust only recently. It is that the earliest novel ever published in the world was written in kana, a form of vernacular Japanese, as a diary with poems. It was written around 1010 by this author. She is Lady Murasaki Shikibu Niki, the first novel in the world was written by this author, a woman. And I'd like to close with her poem, which I think describes a lost past, recreates it for us, and is both fiction and truth. May that lady live 1,000 years who guards the flowers. My sleeves are wet with thankful tears, as though I had been working in a garden of dewy chrysanthemums. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.